as you see, we are adopting, well, maybe not a strictly legal perspective, but still, we're all lawyers uh, and will intend to focus on, on the legal response um, and we'll use the term legal response or legal acts instead of public decisions, which will be uh, prob prob probably typical of uh, political scientists. Now, could we move to the next slide? Um, just to explain very briefly why we think that this particular issue deserves uh, wide coverage. Well, freedom of religion, I believe, m might have been um, out of the spotlight in, in exceptions so far. Uh, and it has not been given proper consideration. But still we think that it deserves a presentation and a proper, a separate chapter in the handbook. Uh, since the issues related to freedom of religion or belief cannot really be reduced to uh, the issues resulting from the suppression of freedom of assembly or freedom of free movement. As you know, collective worship was considered to be uh, to facilitate the transmission of the coronavirus and, uh, uh, and, and, and the church premises were, were commonly considered to be hotbeds for infection. And this sparked a, a a, a very hot debate in many countries, including Poland, which we have in mind, even though if we do not limit our considerations to Poland. Uh, and because of that, the restrictions on collective worship would be questioned from the very beginning, from the very phase of the pandemic, not just from the first wave, but from the very first days of the, of the first wave. And this turned out to be a very tricky issue because religion and p both the social dimension of religion and personal religiosity remains a very important factor in the lives of many Europeans. And if you remember that the first wave actually started shortly before Easter, this just shows how important this issue turned out to be in many European countries. Now, the structure of this presentation will be as follows. Uh, Max will start with the overview of available data, so what we have effectively in the database, uh, and then uh, Max will follow about the restrictions on religious gatherings, which is one of the subtype events in the database. Then Olivia, who is actually celebrating her birthday today, and I was supposed not to say this, but I will say it anyway, uh, will comment on uh, the, the restrictions on funeral attendance, and how the measures were implemented. And then I will be back to briefly conclude and to give you some policy guidelines which are mostly which which are not just rooted in the, the in the database but also in the, the existing legal scholarship on the freedom of religion or belief in a time of pandemic. This is really refreshing that I can actually leave most of this presentation to to Max and Olivia. So again without further ado you start. Okay, many thanks Wojciech for your introduction. So uh, I think we should start with reminding us how restrictions on religious freedoms uh, were coded. So each legal act that introduces restrictions specifically aimed, uh, aimed at religious freedom uh, have been ascribed with one of the values that you see now on the screen. And uh, and uh, so you can you can have a look at this, but <coughs> I will exploit more uh, when I will come to the conclusions. However, I can say right now that most that actually only light and heavy restrictions have been imposed at all, and this is the sign. This is a very optimistic sign, and one of our conclusions is that that we. Uh, that there was actually non restrictions heavy or light that was made at specific religions so uh so the 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 minorities religious minorities were not treated in uh worse way than uh the majorities uh restrictions on religious freedom have been identified in twenty two of out of twenty five countries analyzed. And uh, and the countries that did not pass specific regulation are Hungary, Ireland, and Luxembourg. I think it's worth adding here that uh, we we relied on 
the final third version of the data set. And according to the data set, uh, <coughs> the, specific, uh, the restrictions on religious freedom have been identified also in Austria, uh, Norway, and Sweden. However, there were only one or two acts uh, the introduced aimed at uh, the restrictions of religious freedom. So I guess it should be checked whether is it is it real restriction of religious freedom or maybe it's miscoded somehow. Uh, and of course, uh, when some countries did not pass specific uh, legislation aimed at restricting religious freedom, it does not mean that religious freedom was not. Uh, restricted at all. Of course, other uh, other restrictions like obviously stay-at-home requirement or restriction of public gatherings or less uh, obvious like uh, social rules or social distance rules, sorry, or uh, obligatory mask, they uh, affected enjoying religious freedom in a bigger or smaller degree too. And of course, it applies to countries that pass specific uh, registration and to uh, to the countries that did not pass the specific uh, legislation in this matter. So how to, what is the difference between heavy and light restrictions on religious freedom? Well, as you can see, uh, heavy restrict by heavy restrictions I meant restrictions that suspended religious activity at all or limit the number of people they were allowed to gather together to 15. So it was really, really tough restrictions. Whereas light restrictions were understood more broadly and uh, the restrictions were designated as light if they allowed uh, 15 persons, persons of more to participate in religious activities or imposed more or less uh, Less, uh, less burdensome obligations like obligation to wear mask or keep social distance, restricted time or use of uh, certain objects of wor worship during religious, religion, re religious events or affected in other ways uh, certain elements of religious ceremonies or worship without suspending it at all or limiting in a great uh, number. So, uh, coming now, moving on to to the main conclusions that uh, that uh, can be derived from data re related to religious freedom. Uh, restrictions, light restrictions, were imposed twice as often as heavy restrictions on religious freedom. And as I said before, there was no case of a restriction that was aimed at specific religions. Actually, this is a thing that should be discussed further. There are two or three records that were coded as heavy or light restrictions on specific religions. We found out that those acts relate to, uh, to suspension of certain one-time individual event of uh, Catholic event, exactly. So it's rather application of a general rule to an individual situation, not a restriction at all. So in our view, it should not be uh, understood as, as heavy or light restriction on religious freedom. And the range of uh, legislative acts concerning freedom of religions was either significant in countries like Germany, where we had uh, 90, almost 100 acts concerning specifically freedom of religious freedom. In Spain, almost 150. Uh, in, uh, in Cyprus, also, it was uh, 80 acts, and in, in Greece, uh, in Greece, almost 50, whereas most of the most of the records from Greece are from the third wave, as we learned, maybe uh, to some extent problematic, or marginal in other countries like, for example, Finland, six uh, only six acts, Netherlands one, Norway one, Portugal eight, Sweden one. So as you can see, it was really marginal. Uh, Yeah, much. exactly. And 
Well, here appears the problem that we raised, the, the issue uh, uh, that we raised during uh, Q&A session after uh, Raul presentation. Well, how to uh, describe decentralized countries. Because we can see that the high intensity of lawmaking was present in Germany, Spain, Cyprus, and Greece. So uh, I think we should find out a kind of a label to grab this country to derive the proper conclusions. And of course, uh, the same uh, for the next conclusion as we learned from previous presentation, the same, the general remarks applies also to the specific religious freedom. Most restrictions were intended to cover the subnational level. And, uh, and, and the legal review of the adopted measures was marginal, which is <coughs> Uh, during the first three waves, uh, there was only one case where the act concerning religious freedom uh, have been subject has been subject to constitutional review. It was in Spain. F in other countries, in Romania, one act was subject to uh, parliamentary approval, and in Spain and Malta, one acts were uh, scrutinized by administrative bodies, and. Uh, of also, almost all restrictions uh, were introduced for a limited period of time. Only thirty-one cases. Only in thirty-one cases, uh, the restrictions were introduced for indefinite period. And lastly, almost all restrictions uh, were, let's say, premises-oriented. Uh, According to those restrictions, the number of people who could uh, were who uh, the number of people allowed to gather together on religious uh, premises were limited, or religious gathering were suspended at all. Only f in few cases, especially in Spain, the law was uh, the law was adapted according to which certain elements of religious worship were restricted. For example, the use of blessed water, which was which was high spot on transmission of the virus. And I give you floor to Olivia. She will say about uh, restrictions on funeral attendance. I should say it at the beginning that in our chapter, we analyzed restrictions coded, at, coded as subtype even 206, which relates to restrictions on religious freedom, as well as uh, restrictions coded as subtype even 310 uh, concerning restrictions on funeral attendance. It, this is due to the fact that, well, religious, the, the funeral ceremonies and cemeteries in Europe are very often of religious nature. And we find out that to deliver the full or as broad as possible picture of uh, restrictions on religious freedom, we should analyze both of these uh, subtype events. Okay, thank you, Max. Uh, turning to restrictions on funeral ceremonies, it should be noted that uh, the restrictions were introduced in 22 out of 25 countries analyzed. Uh, they were not adopted in Estonia, Norway, and Sweden. Uh, when it comes to the sanction related to these restrictions, in most cases restrictions were not uh, accompanied by any sanction. Uh, if a viola violation of uh, the ban was punishable, it was either a fine or uh, alternatively a fine and imprisonment. Okay, uh, as the graph shows, uh, based on the data collated in exceptions, uh, in most cases we do not have data to conclude uh, that a sanction uh, was imposed for not compliance with the prohibition on funeral ceremonies. So, as we can see, uh, in the most cases we have no data about it, and uh, in marginal uh, it's fine or fine with jail sentence. Uh, considering the scale of the funeral attendance ban, uh, in most cases the number of people who could attend the funerals was fixed at approximately 10 to uh, 50 people. Uh, less burdensome restrictions were introduced in Austria, Belgium, Denmark, Germany and Spain. 
where the number of people allowed to participate in funeral ceremonies range from 60 to 500 people. Uh, to a small extent, state cho chose to impose restrictions that limited the number of participants to a maximum of uh, nine people, uh, while very strict restrictions remain in place throughout the three waves of pandemic. Acts introducing medium restrictions, uh, 10 to uh, 50 people, uh, were more numerous during the first and the second wave, uh, waves of the pandemic. Uh, and what about implementation of measures? Uh, based on exceptions data, it can be confirmed that the restriction on freedom of religion have been implemented for the most part uh, through executive acts, both at national and subnational levels. Uh, this is inconsistent with the principle that legislative acts are established by the legislature. In some countries, restrictions on religious freedom were implemented through advisory acts that had no legal force but offered simply guidelines. The guidelines encouraged religious leaders to consider changes that could be introduced to religious rituals. And for example, uh, these rituals like uh, using holy water or something like that. Uh, as we can see from the chart, uh, for the most part, countries opted for executive acts, both at national and subnational levels, uh, but admi administrative acts also appeared. The national legislative is marginal, only one, only one act. So why the popularity of executive acts? After all, most countries provide for states of emergency for such circumstances, which are rich in legal procedures uh, for dealing with unexpected situations. I will briefly point out uh, what could be a potential reason for the choice of executive acts. Firstly, uh, it would go too far to say that parliaments had no opportunities to convene during the pandemic, uh, but it is true that their functioning was obstructed. Secondly, it takes time to for Parliament to pass a new legislation. Uh, in Poland, for example, the Senate has 30 days to take a decision on a legislation. So it takes time, so the executive acts will be easier uh, to, to use than something like, uh, something like uh, legislative acts. And thirdly, uh, choosing executive act instead of imposing a state of emergency and following the procedures uh, facilitate the violation of fundamental rights. The greater and the direct the threat, the more likely people appear to be tolerant of even illegal uh, restrictions on human rights in general, especially uh, restrictions on religious freedom, which don't seem to be as direct. Uh, and what can I say? The introduction of uh, restriction on religious freedom in executive acts deserve criticism. Uh, the use of executive acts, however, had its far-reaching effects. Firstly, imposing restriction on religious freedom through executive acts that are not subject to parliamentary procedure uh, were incompatible with the standards set for in Article 9 of European Convention of Human Rights. In many cases, emergency measures introduced by executive acts have been imposed in violation of laws. And secondly, the use of executive acts for the purpose of limiting fundamental rights, freedom of religion and, or belief uh, among them, had an impact on the state's ability to enforce com compliance and uphold administrative penalties before the courts. Many courts have doubted that uh, legality of sanction adopted in executive acts. Okay, and now I'm back just for a short coda before we finish. Well, the, the policy recommendations which we opted for and we decided to have them in the chapter may not be entirely supported but by what you've just heard and by raw data, uh, but they are further elaborated in the text of the chapter and they also mm, they are also supported by the findings of some other groups studying freedom of religion or belief in times of COVID-19 such as Grupo Redesoc 
at the University Complutense uh, of Madrid, uh, which I was part of. Um, the thing is that, uh, in principle, public health appears to be uh, unconditionally superior to values such as spiritual well-being. But this doesn't mean that mm, it works like this at all times and in all circumstances, and that protection of public health can be used as a blanket justification for any actions and any restrictions affecting freedom of religion or belief. Uh, this is something that mm, was probably disregarded by in several jurisdictions and by several legislators, and it should be remembered that the, the, these two values need always to be uh, to be balanced against each other. Mm, and we do not really believe that we need some special tools, um, special tools for special times uh, as far as the, the, the COVID pandemic is concerned and the freedom of religion or belief. This is because if you apply proportionality as we should do it, if you take proportionality seriously, you will find that it actually provides the answers to all the dilemmas we might have. So, for example, if we discover in the, in the data set that freedom of religion or belief was heavily suppressed in jurisdictions or in, in regions where that was not really necessary because of what we knew at that time, because what this epidemiological situation was at that time, and if you discover, for example, that the, uh, that the number of people allowed on the premises was set at the same level for small village churches and a big cathedral whose ceiling is barely visible from, uh, for, 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 for a regular believer, because it's, it's so spacious, that you realize that it makes no sense. And in, in fact, we should use proportionality to ask ourselves about the validity and also the legality, in a broad sense, of the restrictions introduced. And finally, something which we haven't mentioned today, but this is, mm, this is one of the, the recommendations or, or a guideline which, comes, which pops up in any study of freedom of religion or belief uh, in, times of, uh, in times of this COVID pandemic, is that the key to draft the restrictions in a good way and to make them effective and to boost the, their efficiency and to stimulate implementation is to cooperate with religious leaders. And this can help draft them in a way which would not heavily suppress religious freedom and at the same time which would ensure their efficiency and also legitimacy. Um, this appears to be uh, the key to to successful implementation of any safety protocol that affects the religious rituals. I think that's it. Thank you so much. We'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. You have the coders here, and I'll be happy to assist them in any, any doubt. You may have.